Hey folks, it's man once again. And so I had to think a while to give my thoughts on this film, Interstellar. Interstellar, 2014 film directed by Christopher Nolan. And right off the bat, I can say I did not hate this film. This is not a rant. I like the film. There's particularly one thing that just keeps gnawing at my brain that bugs the shit out of me. A couple things, one big one, which I can't get into until I go into spoilers. <laughs> but I think there is a lot that, no, I think, I know there's a lot that I like in the film. Now, right off the bat, no one, I don't think he's the best director of all time. Made me think of the Will Smith scene in Men in Black. Got Captain America over here. He's the best of the best of the best, sir. With honors. No, I don't think Christopher Nolan is the best. I do not like his Batman films. I do not like them. Don't get me, well, but it's about, what, you don't like films about character? You, and about, you know what, if I want to watch those films, I'll watch Michael Mann films like Collateral and Heat. Which I think are better than his <laughs> Nolan's Batman films. If I want to watch those films, I'll watch Michael Mann's Collateral and Heat. Those have characters... Those have depth, and those don't make those entertain me. Collateral and Heat, I'd rather watch than his Batman films. Batman films, I think, are extremely overrated. His Batman films. Yes, I like Batman, Batman Returns. God forbid, I like entertaining film. I like. It's not about that. Because I swear, with those films, you get into fucking wars with people about it. It's just a movie. Memento I found interesting. And by the way, if you like those films, that's fine. But I've had enough of people dragging me into fights because they want to defend it. Fine. If you love it, that's fine. We disagree. Memento was interesting, but it was a one-watch thing when I understood, oh, you know, them little short-term memory and telling that story pretty much backwards and... I, I got where it was going, but it was one and done deal. Insomnia, I liked the cast of the film. I thought Al Pacino did a good job. I thought Robin Williams, Robin Williams did a good job. Didn't care for the ending. Uh, didn't care for what happened to Al Pacino's character, just preference-wise. Um, I really enjoyed Inception. Did he do a film called The Prestige? That's what if he did, that's one of those films I barely remember. I did really like Inception. I would still say Inception is my favorite Nolan film. I'd probably put this at number two. But to be honest, it's the only two Nolan films that I would I will put in the like category. Like I say, I really enjoy Inception. I had a review of Inception Inception up, but copyright claims taken down. But I enjoyed that film. This film now. I mean, the story, planet is dying because of this, it's called blight. Crops are dying. It takes place in the future where they really are more gung-ho about farming because people need food. Food is drying out. So they need more farmers. They don't need engineers. That's a line of dialogue. I mean, even to a point where at school they want to teach that the Apollo missions were fake because they don't want people to worry about exploration. They want to worry about being here at home, worrying about getting food. And um, one of his Matthew McConaughey's kids, sorry, you're not. He's not going to college. You know, he should be a farmer. We need more farmers. Matthew McConaughey, I'll say he did a great job. He was one of the my favorite parts of this movie. I love Matthew McConaughey as an actor. I know I haven't seen a lot of his recent films. Being a big fan, I should. But just haven't had time and, and such. But I liked him in The Lincoln Lawyer. He gave a good performance in Time to Kill. He's been in a lot of films. 
Clint has a Texas Chainsaw Master 4. But I, I always enjoyed him as an actor. It was nice to see him in this kind of big sci-fi movie. It's nice to see an actor that you enjoy get that chance to be in a big sci-fi movie. And that was a cool thing to see. That was one of the coolest things for me to see. Being a big fan of this guy, getting his chance to be in that kind of movie. And I thought he did an excellent job. In fact, I thought the acting was fine. John Lithgow plays his father. That was cool because it reminded me of 2010. That John Lithgow and Rory Scheider, which I love 2010, which is the sequel to 2001 The Space Odyssey. I love 2010, so that was nice. Can't help but wonder if that was a little bit on purpose. <clears throat> Michael Caine makes an appearance. Uh, Matt Damon actually makes an appearance later in the film. The acting is fine. Anne Hathaway, I thought she did all right. Wes Bentley, I thought he did fine. Topher Grace makes a small appearance. Thankfully, it's a small one because I don't like him as an actor. T.C. Affleck makes an appearance. And I like him as an actor. You have two robots. One's actually voiced by Josh Stewart, which he doesn't get a lot of lines of dialogue, unfortunately, but it was cool that Josh Stewart was in there somewhere. So I thought the cast did fine. The daughter character thought the actress, actresses did fine. And it's a good looking movie. Visually beautiful to look at. It's ambitious, which I can appreciate. I thought Hans Zimmer did a great job on the score. Remind me of bits of 2001 a Space Odyssey or maybe, maybe. Maybe not. I, I feel like that's the feeling Hans Zimmer was going for, but Kubrick. I don't know how to. I know this sounds stupid, but the score made me think of a Kubrick movie, which is not a bad thing. I thought Hans Zimmer. It's not. It's not like he did the same score that he did for Inception. I actually like the score he did for Inception, but I thought he did a pretty good job with this score as well. And. Some really good emotional sequences that made me feel, which I'll get more into. And there's certain plot points that I didn't understand or didn't get. And I have to go into spoilers. I think people watching this video, you've you've either seen Interstellar or you just gotta wait to see it and judge it yourself. But my opinion on I gotta go more into spoilers to talk about this movie. I do think the film feels a little bit long because it's two hours and forty nine minutes. Now, granted, two thousand one Space Odyssey is a long movie as well. That was a film though that I saw. I'll admit I I still think two thousand one is a classic. I say I prefer 2010 more with Roy Scheider. That's my favorite of, of that, of those two films. I like Contact, which also had Matthew McConaughey. Uh, let's see. I love Gravity. I would put Gravity above this. And people are like, oh, you're stupid. Gravity had no story. I think Gravity had a simple enough story. It was a survival story. I thought it had some repressed special effects. I love the score. I like the performances. And it was only 90 minutes. And... It didn't have that, yeah, whenever you go into space, you don't have plot inconsistencies, logics going out the window. I know that. And a lot of times that doesn't bother me. Think of any sci-fi film, there's going to be plot stuff that may go, huh? But there's one in here that even me, I just could not get through. Anything in gravity, I can go over easily. Be like, that's fine. You go with the, it's just a movie, enjoy it mentality. But there's one thing later on in the film, which I'll probably talk, I'll talk about later. Just, just stuck in my crawl. <laughs> but it does feel a bit long, two hours and 49 minutes. The first 30, 40 minutes I thought was pretty good. It established a little bit of this future. I thought it was well photographed. Matthew McConaughey is a farmer. Used to be a pilot for NASA. 
kid. John Lithgow is his father. He has an older son and a younger daughter. Her daughter keeps saying that she sees a ghost or she there's a ghost there and of course he doesn't believe it. So pretty much about how the dust is covering places throughout the world. I should say throughout the world, but at least their area. Kind of like the Dust Bowl from back then. And I thought, Matthew McConaughey, again, I thought he did a great job. He had a fun sequence where he had to go to a parent-teacher conference, and the teacher was talking about, well, she was picking a fight with someone because of these books, and we said that she had a book, but it's an older version of the book. It's not a newer version where we said that the moon landing was fake, because we don't want to teach kids that that was real. We don't want them to explore because they need to be here. And I thought Matthew McConaughey, because he was a NASA pilot, he just had a great reaction. And, you know, those that sprint it, that type of discovery, um, thought of a, God, what the hell was it? Um, not EMT. Oh, fuck. I'm drawing a blank. This, what scans your brain? MRI. You know, that found the thing that was in my wife's brain. And uh, how did he word it? You know, she would be here instead of me, and she was a lot more of the, the calm one. <laughs> you could tell he's visibly upset. And they're like, well, what are you going to do to punish your daughter? And she, he's like, well, there's a baseball game coming. And I think I'm going to take her to that. And then he comes out and talks to his daughter. He's like, I got you suspended. <laughs> and she's like, what? And I know I fucked that up. I didn't do that correctly. But I thought that was a fun bit of scene. I thought Matthew McConaughey and the little girl who played his daughter, they had good... Uh, relationship with each other and they just see where they're chasing this drone Matthew McConaughey is excited about and he's able to make it so that they take control of the drone and they look into it and even though he's a farmer he still wants to be out there he wants to explore he wants to do that a guy you can relate to because I can relate to that you know to be in space that was always a dream of mine to be in space I mean actually be in space to actually go out there and explore that was always a cool idea, something that I think a lot of people dreamed of. So it's something to relate to. A lot of crops are dying, and one thing leads to another. And this ghost is actually messages for these coordinates. And Matthew McConaughey is able to figure this out, which leads him to this place, which is you have Michael Caine there, and Anne Hathaway, and Wes Bentley. They have these robots, or one of them called TARS, which is a really interesting. I believe they went with a practical effect. And it's like a mini monolith. It really is. It's like a mini monolith that has one body and two arms that go like this. And it really looks like a mini monolith. Think of a, a midget monolith that talks. And they even put in a sarcastic humor into them. So later on, so you guys going to enjoy being in my robot slave army? <laughs> or my human, God, I forget the line of dialogue. My, it's basically saying how you guys going to enjoy being in my slave army, my army of slaves. And I'm not doing a good job with that, but I thought it had some pretty fun lines, the the TARS robot and then when they get up there there's another robot robot called Case and that's actually voiced by Josh Stewart and even Matthew McConaughey says you don't talk much do you? well TARS does more TARS does enough talking for both of us but it's cool that they have robots join them and they're like mini monoliths and one's more black and one's more like grayish and some of the stuff that they can do, for example, if you see the trailer, you see this weird thing that has like three prongs. Um, and it's like going like this. That's actually one of the robots. I thought that was kind of cool. It was kind of interesting. 
but like the little girl and uh, Matthew McConaughey get to Michael Caine, they talk to him, and they talk about how this thing's going to kill the plants, and there's these missions before Lazarus missions, and to get to this wormhole that will get to this place that possible three planets are habitable and hey you're a pilot you could fly this and the little girl doesn't want him to go but he's like well I have to go and I thought that all played off well as it it's a build up I thought it was a build up that worked good emotion to it acting wasn't bad at all get into space some really good exploration in space and what I mean by that, like it's visually beautiful to look at. They do the thing that I first saw in Event Horizon, where they talk about the the black hole, where they take the paper, they put it in, and they go through it. And yes, I will put Event Horizon above this. Just I prefer Event Horizon and Gravity to this. You know, people will shoot me in the head for that. Oh well. I mean, it's an 8.8 and 9 to B. I think that's a bit too high. Although, for my defense on Gravity, it did get a Best Picture nomination while Interstellar didn't. Of course, fuck the Oscars, so it doesn't matter in the first place. I'm just having fun. Don't take it too seriously. But, I mean, overall, I mean, I'm saying a lot of positive stuff about it. And going through the wormhole was really cool. Pretty, uh... Not even decent. Like it deserved. I think it won the Oscar just for effects, and it deserved that. Maybe it won a couple other technical, but the technical side it deserved it. And they go to one planet, but the problem with this one planet, one hour equals seven years, and that time. So if they go down, they're there for an hour. It's really been seven years. And so they have to make it quick. They go down there, and it's all filled with water, and there's these big tidal waves, and Anne Hathaway doesn't listen. She screws up. She did something, and there's no really information there. Wes Bentley dies. Good sequence because I like you know, the robot going into its, I don't know what the hell you call it, metamorphosing into going over the grab Anne Hathaway and get over Queen. I thought it was some really good special effects and really entertaining sequence. You know, the waves crashing in, them trying to get out, but they're there and they're stuck down there. I thought it worked because he had some good emotion, especially for Matthew McConaughey being pissed. and frustrated because he doesn't want to take too many years, not only away from his kids, but who knows how long the human race has. And when they get back up, they find out that they've actually, even though they've been there for a little bit of time, they've actually been there for 23 years. So 20, 23 years have passed. And once it comes back to Earth, and now, actually, before I get to that, another really good scene when I said emo some emo good emotional scenes, is when he watches the video footage that you know, people left messages during those 23 years and seeing his son grow up to be K Casey Affleck and that hey you, be you became a grandpa and Matthew McConaughey's emotion just excellent job by Matthew McConaughey and then his daughter didn't really leave messages because she felt abandoned but she leaves one and she tells about you know you you talked about how you'd be here on your you know the you come back, we both be the same age, and not being bitchy, but you know, being upset and sad. And Matthew McConaughey knocked it out of the park. But once in a while, it cuts back to her, and she's not now working with Michael Caine, and what they're working at back on Earth is Michael Caine's place that they're at is this big old space station. And they're realizing how to get this all of orbits so that people can actually leave Earth in a place this size. That you know, how would that work out? And then they go to the second planet, which is this ice planet, 
very cold. They find Matt Damon, who was there on a previous mission. And back at home, Michael Caine, in his dying breath, says that it was mostly a sham that they sent there for Plan B. Because Plan A is to find a planet and also find some stuff. So by the time they find a planet that will work, Michael Caine then will find out these a solution to the problem to get this station enter out of off of Earth to head towards that planet. Plan B is to take this to colonize, you know, with stuff in jars and see pretty much see the planet. Not quite like in the Star Trek two, Star Trek three, that kind of seeding the planet, but you know, if we can't get the people off Earth, we'll create people and colonize. That's Plan B. And that always is a shame. And Plan B was there all along, and really just Michael Caine and Matt Damon knew about it. Was that kind of when the film kind of lost me? Because at home you have the daughter going, oh, well, maybe my dad knew, and, and uh, he just abandoned us. And that's when... I didn't really like the daughter character at that point. Maybe people would say, well, that's a normal solution, but it can't help it. When you're watching a film and you know what that that's not what Matthew McConaughey did, and he's going through a lot of shit, I just automatic I just think, wow, you're being bitchy. Yeah, if you think about it, her dad's been away for decades and she doesn't know what's going on. But I turn up, it's like, wow, you're being bitchy. Fuck you, bitch. And then this whole thing where Matt Damon, he wants to follow Plan B, and Matthew McConaughey is like, no, we're going to make Plan A happen. And then this bit kind of reminded me of Sunshine, where all of a sudden you have someone trying to kill people. <laughs> because Matt Damon smacks Matthew McConaughey in the face. This other guy that was with McConaughey and Hathaway, he gets blown up. Matt Damon is, goes up there. I'm like, eh, you know, the whole, oh, here's a, does this movie need what, a, a crazy guy? Although if it was a crazy robot, like a Red Planet done, remember that movie Red Planet with Val Kilmer? But if it was done better, crazy robot, maybe that'd be cool. Like maybe one of the robots go crazy and the other robot and them have to take care of it. But they go with a person, Matt Damon. I don't know, that little bit I didn't care for, but the the movie redeemed my interest when Matt Damon dies, he fucks up, blows himself up, and pretty much, I thought maybe it was because of the music, maybe because of the way it was handled, but Matt McConaughey and the robots and Anne Hathaway using their shuttle to get to their bigger ship in order to dock as it's spinning wildly out of control, I thought that was actually a pretty thrilling sequence. I really liked that sequence. I thought it was handled well, edited well. Great music by Hans Zimmer. I thought great visuals. And then pretty much they're going slingshot to get to the that third last planet. And McConaughey and one of the robots are drop their ships down into this black hole because that's one of the things they need back home. Just by this point, they found out that what Michael King was saying was bullshit. But hey, maybe if I can find this and somehow get it back to Earth, find a way for them to live. And I like the visual aspects going through the black hole and uh, remind me a little bit of 2001 Space Odyssey. Although I will say the 2001 Space Odyssey is much more, made me feel more awe and more like, oh shit. Especially when I first saw it on. He was turned class of movies. But and it gets to an interesting aspect that I thought this worked well emotionally, where getting to the black hole, there's this place that he's at, and it's a the fifth dimensional beings must have built this, and it's you know, time in the physical way. Because everywhere I go is to my daughter's bedroom and throughout the, the time span. And and that ghost that she was seeing, 
that was actually me. And you know, when she thought someone a ghost was pushing the books, that was me. And I can do this and put this the info and Morse code on her watch, and she'll just love transcends. And yeah, you can say that's sappy, but I can deal with sap. I can deal with sap. That's not what bothered me. That's not the thing that bugged me. I thought it worked well because I thought Matthew McConaughey sold it. I thought the visuals were really well done. I thought the woman who played his older daughter, she did a good job in the sequence. And the realization of what's been happening and what's really going on. I thought the scene was handled well. But before I get into the ending, the thing that bugs the fuck out of me... Remember, okay, think of Terminator. Now think of this. How is John Connor born when his father has not even been born by the time he's born? Yeah, we all know the story. John Connor had Kyle Reese and since Kyle Reese back, but how, in the first place, during the very first time, how was John Connor born? during the very first time. How was he born? If his dad wasn't even born yet. But of course back in the day I never thought of it that way. And then it's like, oh yeah, it's Terminator, you I'll, I'll deal with it. I think because I've seen Terminator for decades and I never that never came to my head. I'm like, oh that's right, I never thought of it. I don't have a over a decade's worth of watching this film and then go, oh wait a minute, huh? No, I'm thinking of this the very first time I'm seeing it. That's, that's a big difference. And that's a problem when you deal with time. I think it's called the bootstrap paradox. A lot of time travel stuff have that problem. Whether you're dealing with time travel or anything to do with time. Because Matthew McConaughey says, Oh, this wasn't aliens. This must have been us in the future. When humans evolved to beings that to create this. And I'm thinking, but wait a minute. What future humans? How could they live in the first place if right now you're at a point where humanity humanity is going to suffocate and die on Earth? If humanity is going to suffocate and die on Earth, then during that very first time, you didn't have Matthew McConaughey being put into there. So how does that work? The very first time, what happened? People just suffocated and died on Earth? Kind of like the John Connor thing. One guy, which I mentioned this on Facebook, nice guy named Joe, mentioned, well, it might have been Anne Hathaway, she's landed, and her plan B to colonize, maybe those humans would have grown up to become a being, but... The movie never really says that. It never really even, in my opinion, hints at that. Like, if Matthew McConaughey had said that, and then you had a cut to Anne Hathaway looking at the things that are going to help colon, colon, colonize it, then that would help a little bit. But... I really don't think that's what Nolan had planned. I really do feel like Nolan just did this to get more impact on the father-daughter storyline. And that part worked emotionally for me. But when I think, and I did a lot of movies, I know don't make sense. There's a lot of movies, I'm not talking about realism. I know it's a sci-fi movie, I know I should enjoy it, but I'm watching, I'm like, this just helps kill the movie for me. How does Matthew McConaughey first get there if it's built by future us? How was there a future us in the first place? The very first time they were humans were dead. I did, did never get a clear explanation from that. And I just got stuck in my crawl. I'm like, well, wait a minute, huh? Like, what future us? What? How is there a future us in the first place? In order to have you, okay, put Matthew McConaughey down here so that he can get in touch with his daughter, so that she can get the coordinates, 
and stuff. So she can figure out how to get that ship up to save people and get them off Earth before they die. It just... What future us? By the time it's going on when his daughter was like 37 years old, whatever, looked like Earth was in pretty bad shape as it was. Looked like they didn't have lawn to go. Not that fucking lawn. So it's like... That one big just stuck in my crawl. I mean, I like the other stuff. The visuals of him getting now, and the music, music by Hans Zimmer. Him, when he wakes up, he realizes he's really, he looks the same, but really he's 124 years old. Just all the crazy shit that's happened. Like being on that planet, that one hour equaled seven years, and they were down there for a little bit, it was really 23 years, and so on and so forth. Um, hmm. Then you have Ellen Burstyn play his daughter because it's now 50 years later and before that he's shown this big space station and it looks cool it look, because like people are playing baseball and it shoots up and there's a house that's upside down and it goes into the window. Of course then I'm thinking well wait a minute was there only one space station? Because I know they say well your daughter this play this older play by Ellen Burstyn she's too old to go between space stations too much so at this point there's more than one space station from what they made it sound but back then when Matthew McConaughey was on earth it looked like there was only one station Michael Caine was only talking about this one station and that NASA was hush hush because people didn't want to spend money for NASA because they were too busy surviving and being farmers so did they fit the entire Earth into this one station? Did they fit the entire fucking Earth? Was there a lottery? You lose, sucker. Like, did everyone fit in this one space station? When his daughter found out what to do, did they make more space stations? They must have done that super quick because they didn't they really have too much longer on Earth. Did they go up in one and then create a space station from their space station? I mean, a simple line of dialogue. I mean, if Michael Caine said it, it flew past me. But if Michael Caine said, yeah, we have a couple stations like this, so we can fit, you know, the majority of people on Earth. A line like that, one line, would have saw that. Same with the whole stuff I was saying before. If it was aliens. The, honestly, method, they sh he's, I really feel like Nolan should not have put that it was a future us. Then it would not have bud people so much. You could have said it was aliens. That maybe aliens have visited this long ago and they're like, hey, what happened? How did these people die? And because there's such beings, they can look at time and space and they go look at, oh, there, there was Earth at a point and this is what happened. And they look through it and it's, oh, this is. If they just stuck with aliens, then you wouldn't have the stupidity, the, the fucking logic of, wait a minute, how does a futurist happen if we would have died before? Should just say aliens. Would have been a hell of a lot easier. And people say, well, yeah, it'd be too easy. Yeah, but it would, as stupid as it sounds, aliens would have made more sense than a future us. It really would have. Would have made more sense. It would have. I mean, I think it would have. But I mean, I will say that the the scene between Matthew McConaughey and Ellen Burstyn, her performance, their scene together, it made my eyes misty. So I will say it has a good emotional core to the story. That's because McConaughey and the actresses they got to play his daughters, I thought it worked well. I thought Hans Zimmer's store worked well. And it's a good looking movie, good special effects. It pretty much he's taking a shuttle along with his robot cars. Because the that robot's with him. They're gonna go off to go get Anne Hathaway, who's left on that planet. 
But that one thing, or like a couple things, especially that one big one, just buds the shit out of me. And granted, you can say it with any time travel movie, or any movie dealing with time, understand that. You can say it with Back to the Future, you can say that with Time Cop. But, this one though just got stuck in my crawl, so it's hard for me to love the movie because of that. Oh, you don't like that one thing? It's a pretty big thing. That goes to the, th it's a three hour movie. And you're going to the final act of your three hour journey. And that's the final thrust of your final act. That's the big thrust of your final act. That's where it's all leading up to. And it doesn't make any fucking sense. Especially. Don't give me this. Well, in a linear timeline, yeah, it's impossible. But. Uh, there is no beginning, there is no end. <laughs> Even that doesn't make sense to me. Of course there has to be a beginning. That's like saying, one day, boom, uh, 2014, this year was created. This was just created right out of the blue. You just got pop. No, you remember being, you know, being born, this, this, and this, this, and... Uh, fuck it, uh... That that just bugs the shit out of me, stuck in my crawl. But again, there's a lot of stuff. I appreciate this ambitiousness. I appreciate. I like the visuals, the performances, the scope. But that stuff just bugs the fuck out of me. It really does. So overall, I just say I like the film. But yeah, I would prefer a film like Gravity. It's it's simple. You, you say, like, simple is such a bad idea. Gravity didn't get stuck in my crawl in a bad way like that big point in Interstellar. Not talking not talk about, yeah, there's plot holes and everything, but that one big one is one that you try to explain it to me. You try to explain it. I mean, again, the guy named Joe mentioned, well... Maybe it was that plan B and those guys got created. But, okay, if that's the case, does that mean Anne Hathaway still has to create those? Or is this later down the road when they get to the fifth dimensional being, they're going to go back and create this so that Matthew McConaughey can do it? And... Hell, I don't even know. Are they still going to go with plan B anyway? For the fun of it? Hey, Anne Hathaway, yeah, you still go with plan B and create those as well as create this. More people the merrier. I still don't get the space station thing. Was there one space station? Because with the way Michael Caine explained it, he just showed the place they were at looked like one space station. Were there more than one? I, I didn't think they were because they thought they said they didn't have that much money. I mean, I, I don't know. Mainly it's that, that big one. It is... But yeah, there's a lot of stuff I liked about it. But I just, I don't know how else to say it. I don't know how else to end it. But that's my review of Interstellar. Obviously, by the review, you could tell I did not hate the film. That overall, I could say I liked the film, but I didn't love the film. Specifically for that one big point that is a jarring point of the film, folks. You can't say it's a little, oh, it's just a... What would people call it? A nitpick. It's not a nitpick when it's a three hour movie and it goes, it's the primary function of your third act. The final act of your three hour journey. Where it's all leading up to that one point, that one point you look at it and go, that doesn't make sense. It's sci fi, that's supposed to make sense. But even, you just still give bullshit reasons. It's hard for me to even come up with bullshit reasons for this. But anyway, that's just my thoughts on it. But, uh, you know, you repeat yourself. Yeah, I repeat myself. Because sometimes people say stuff. And I'm like, did you hear what I said? Did you hear what I said? Did you hear what I said? Did you hear that I said that I didn't hate the film? That I liked the film? That I liked the performances? That I really enjoyed Matthew McConaughey? I thought he did a kick-ass job? That I love? I thought the score by... Hans Zimmer was pretty damn good. I uh, thought the visuals were really great. 
So yeah, I like the film. But when Matt Damon being a bad guy, that I think it just made me think of Sunshine and I don't know, just lost me a bit there in the movie. The film was a little bit too long for my liking. And that big plot point thing. I just what? So I like the film, but I don't love the film. And that's my reviews on Interstellar. So thanks for watching and take care. Later.